nurse from the procedure, I would come down with a real high fever, and he was right. And I got through that, and then we started getting results of all the stuff that he took out, and they sent away. And so uh, I'm a very sick person. Um, most of you knew I was sick in the mind, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, OK, they said my mic is not turned on. It says that it has a green light on it. So maybe I just need to be a bigger mouth. Yeah? I might be li limited in my wind, but I, I got a big mouth. So. Now, uh, so I just wanted to say th thank you for your prayers because uh, the journey continues. And um, as, as they are showing me things that were found in my lungs and, the, and the, the complications, it reminds me very much of where I was in 2005 when I went to National Jewish Medical Center in Denver that my doctor would clean me out. I had five, five of this pr procedure uh, five times before I went to Denver to National Jewish Hospital, and each time it all came back. And I sense that's happening now, but I don't know. But uh, I know that uh, God is in control, and so uh, he's concerned about the lack of immune function in my body and some other things. So um, the reason I say all that is that uh, in 2005, when I was real sick, I had a friend who was a, a, a clinical psychologist, and uh, he recommended, he said, uh, you know, because I met with him because I was kind of discouraged, he said, Bob, you need to tell your congregation you're sick. Quit trying to beat Iron Man, which... I've done 19 Ironman triathlons, and I have a tendency to think, well, yeah, I'll get through this. No, I'm not. And so Jan and I talked about this, and she said, when people ask you, tell the truth. I'm very sick. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that God has given me grace, and I thank you for your prayers. I'm, this is a praying church, and let me say that thank you very much, because I knew you all were praying for me, and thank you for words of encouragement. I'd encourage you to pick up one of our articles. Next week, we're going to put them back in the bulletin because we don't want these things just going around, just laying around. So pick these up. We have a whole rack full of things that I write on a topic every week. And the reason I write articles and I put it as a blog on my website and all is because I write for my congregation. I write as if I was writing to you and the things that come on my mind. So uh, uh, actually, the, the one that I wrote that will be sent out tomorrow will be in this church on next Sunday, Lord willing. Is that right, Anthony? I think so. Okay. I need to get it to you then, don't I? Okay. Uh, this one is God is watching, and it's a word of encouragement because sometimes we think that God doesn't care. It's a scary thing to think that God is watching over every move we make, but it's also a good thing, isn't it? That we know that we don't escape from his love and his kindness. So that's a, so that is there. And also... Uh, the sermon notes are back in the, in the bulletin, and the, today, the purpose of the crowd. The purpose of the crowd. We're looking at John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. When I say that this is Palm Sunday, there are certain things that, as a preacher, that you go to a church and you say, well, what am I going to preach on? Well, I start preaching through books of the Bible. I like expository preaching, because you never have to think about what you're going to preach on next week. You just go to that. And then there are certain dates, like... Uh, you know, Christmas time, you, you preach on the birth of Jesus. It's never wrong to preach on that. And then, of course, uh, Easter Sunday, next Sunday, what do we preach on? The resurrection, right? But you know what? We preach on these things, the, the, the birth, the death, and the, and the resurrection of Jesus every week. That's called the gospel. Okay, but sometimes, as the old preacher said, if there's a bird that flies in the room, you can't ignore it. The bird that is flown, flies in the room every year at this time is... Palm Sunday. Okay, so we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, but I'm going to look at, it, look at it from a different perspective this morning, and I'm calling this the purpose of the crowd. Before I even preface what we're going to do and pray, let me just bring up a scripture. You know it, and you probably rely on it. It is a promise of God. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God works all things together for good. For those who love God, those who are the called according to his purpose. Well, sometimes we can't see what God is doing on the intricate things that surround where we are and what we're doing and where we're going. And I want to show you today that we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. 
actually the donkey's colt. And as he's riding into Jerusalem on the donkey's colt, the crowds are singing, Hosanna, loud Hosannas. And the Pharisees are over there, and they are just fuming. I reckon if you could see it, that the, their ears would be smoke coming out. Okay, the crowd, they didn't really know what's going on, but as we'll see, they, they were just participating some of them really believed, but some of them, what they believed that Jesus was going to march into Jerusalem now he's, because he's declaring himself king, he's the Messiah. He's going to go in there and he's going to go to the fort, the Roman fort there, and say, get out of town because there's a new sheriff in town. But Jesus had another thing in mind. And so as we look at this, there's the chief priests and the elders who gathered together in a and the high priest with Caiaphas. And they plotted together to arrest Jesus and to do it by stealth. They were going to do it by stealth, capture Jesus, and hide him during the feast of the Passover. Because they didn't want to stir up the crowd. The problem with that is, Jesus is the Passover lamb. And so he must be crucified during Passover. The priest didn't want to do that. And so this is a scene that we're going to look at today that God used. You know, he uses everything that happens for multiple purposes. Isn't it interesting that God is a multitasking God? Isn't it good that he's a multitasking God? Because everyone in this room could be praying to God at the same time and having different requests, and he knows all of them. Isn't that good? I mean, I have a whole hard time if Jan is talking to me and someone else talking to me to listen to both of them and try to respond. Okay, sometimes she does that when I'm on the phone and she'll be talking to me and I'm hearing, I just have to say, hold on a second, and I talk to Jan. Or sometimes, okay, we can't do that, but God can listen to every one of his people in the world could be calling upon him at the same time and he listens intently to each one of them. Isn't he marvelous? But not only that, but he is multi-purposeful. He can purpose things at the same time. And you see one thing going on, and you see it from one perspective, and I see it from another perspective, and, and yet all those things have purpose in God's marvelous plan. And so the scene is Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. It's a celebrated as Messiah, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9. It's a demonstration of another way that was fulfilled before their eyes as a way of saying, see, and you still, you people do not believe. But it was also a point to the Pharisees. Another dagger to get them really mad because now they're going to move even faster to get rid of Jesus. And in the hands of God, they have him crucified as the Passover lambs are being killed. Isn't that wonderful how God does that? He is in control and we celebrate that. And he does work all things together for good to those who, are the, uh, who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture in John chapter 12. As we unpack this scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem, we pray for the grace of the Holy Spirit to un, unpack it in our minds that we might appreciate the hand of God and the work of God pointing to our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, by whom we are able to put, have his blood applied to us that as the death angel would, would move to take us even to the second death, that he would pass by us. The judgment of God would pass by because of the blood of Christ, our Passover. So Father, need help. We need help in understanding and getting what this text says. And so we pray for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.
The Pharisees were those who did not really comprehend what Jesus was about, nor did they want to. They had time and time again, Jesus preached before them. They saw the miracles. They denied the miracles. They found fault with whatever he did. And Jesus told them, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's a preface to the gospel. If you don't believe Jesus, you'll die in your sins. All right? But this is found in the book of John. Now, John writes, when he ends the book of John, he says, These things I've written to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So as we look at this scene, this is part of what John is writing. Okay, the Pharisees didn't believe, and Jesus said, you're going to die in your sins because you don't believe. So we don't want to be like that. But John says, I've written all these things in this Gospel of John that you might see that Jesus is the Christ and that you might believe in him and have life in his name. So what we're doing is breaking this down this morning before I read John 12, verses 1 through 19. Let me point out where we're going. We're going to look at this from the Pharisees. The Pharisees want Jesus dead. They're watching for opportunity to take him. And they get more and more perplexed as time goes by. We look at it from the standpoint of Jesus. He was, he's in complete control. At one time, the people tried to take his life, but he walked right through them. At one time, they wanted to make him king. And uh, they were coming at him, and he just walked into the mountain. Okay? And now he's going to die at a specific time, in a specific way, and fulfill the prophecy that he is the sacrificial Passover lamb, for he is our Passover. What do you mean by that? You know, it's interesting. I mentioned this in, in, in earlier, but... The Passover lamb, the children of Israel were given this Passover feast as a remembrance because the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt. And uh, after all those, uh, all those miracles and those plagues in Egypt, uh, Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. And so there's one more coming, and so prepare for it. And the children of Israel were to have a sacrificial lamb set aside, okay, and they were to... As they sacrificed the lamb, they would take the blood of that lamb and put it upon their doorpost. And that, that night, the death angel came. And anybody who did not have the blood on the doorpost, the firstborn died from the, from the what would it call, the palace of the Pharaoh to the lowly slave outside Anybody who did not have the, 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 the blood on the doorpost, the firstborn died. And so we celebrate that as one of the sacraments of God in the Old Testament that said it displayed his covenant of grace. He showed grace to the Israelites by telling them to put the blood on the doorpost. Well, Jesus is the Passover lamb, our Passover lamb. He died that his blood might cover our sins. Now we have... We don't have the Passover feast, but we have the Lord's Supper. Well, again, we say the blood of Jesus Christ has covered our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ has paid the debt for our sins. We go free because Jesus died. That's the gospel, friends. And so when we look at Jesus as the Passover, we're going to look at the details of that as he has to die when the Passover lambs are being sacrificed. The disciples, they didn't understand everything going on. They were caught up in that. They were looking for Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom. And yet they kept following Jesus and doing what he said. And then, you know, we get these little words like John when he writes, oh, and then after the resurrection, we understood this. <laughs> That's good. Okay? So, so they're, not, they're not totally out of it because they just didn't get it when Jesus was happening. Now the, the crowd. The crowd is fickle as always. Some of them showed up just because Lazarus was there. Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Wouldn't you have liked to have seen him? I would have liked to have seen him. Would you go see him? The guy that was dead for four days, his body was starting to decompose, and Jesus spoke to him, and boom, he is alive. You know, uh, when I, I went to Brazil to preach, and I soon realized... They didn't invite me there because I'm such a hot shot preacher. You go to Brazil, and people in Brazil want to know English. They study English. And so all the church has to do is say, we're going to have a preacher from America, 
He's going to preach in English. And we're going to have a translator. And so everybody there is, oh, I can go and hear some English and have it translated. And I can work on my English while I'm there. So you know, I would go to these churches and pff, filled up. Well, they didn't come to hear me. Not the content of what I was saying. They were here because they wanted to hear somebody speak in English. I was like a, you know, like a, a bait. Come and hear this preacher. Okay. Anyway, what am I getting at? Lazarus is like bait. Come and see the man that was once dead. Okay. The crowd had all kinds of things. So let me just read it. John 12, verses 1 through 19. This is kind of setting the scene at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus where they had a feast. Hear the word of God. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, uh, whom he had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table, with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment and made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, and John steps in here and gives a little commentary, he says, he was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for the 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a, he was a thief. Having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. I love how John, excuse me for making a comment here, but I love how John gives a little comment. He's just a commentator, isn't he? Yeah, he's giving a little commentary. Okay, Jesus said, leave her alone, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Watch that. For the poor you have always have with you, but you do not always have me. And when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because of an account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Well, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to the Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming and sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and that had been done to him. And the crowd that had been with him when they called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone out after him. Okay, they are fuming. The world has gone out after them. Obviously, it's not, it's not the entire world because that's from Bethany to Jerusalem is only two miles. It is down the mountain, the Mount of Olives, so two miles. So the, just think about the number of people there in a two-mile stretch. If you've ever been to a big parade, you probably get understand that. Two miles. That's all it is. Two miles. So if it was packed, you know, the Pharisees said, the whole world is there. I know it. Okay? And they, they didn't have the whole world, but it was big enough that they were fuming about it. So let's look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees' ultimate purpose was found in, in, in verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verses 45 through 53, when it says that the, many of the Jews, therefore, had come uh, with Mary and see, to see, uh, see what he did, and, and they believed in him. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they, there were many people that were there. And some of the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, well, what are we going to do about this? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place, both our place and our nation. Okay, so they're concerned that the people are going to gather around Jesus. This is before the scene that we're getting at in John 12. And so here's what, notice what happens here. And this is really cool, because as I read this, and I think it's on your, your uh, sermon notes page, but it's found in John chapter 11, verse 49. Caiaphas 
who was a high priest. I want you to notice how John gives the account and then he gives a little commentary. All right. And he says he was a high priest that year. He says, you know nothing at all. Do you understand that if it is better for you that one should die for the people, not for the whole na- and that the whole nation, and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, one person dies so that the nation does not perish. And then John puts his little commentary in there. He did not say this on his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, now watch this, from that day on, they had plans to put him to death. Now we read in Matthew earlier that they wanted to put him to death, but they wanted to do it subtly and secretly because they didn't want to strip the crowd and they wanted to put him to death after the Passover. But Caiaphas gives us, says, Jesus must die for the nation. Hmm. And then Jesus, it says that Jesus no longer walked among the Jews, but the chief priests and the Pharisees gave orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So they're mad before they get started here. In John chapter, what I'm getting at, the Pharisees were upset before he gets started. And they wanted to, to snatch him, hide him, and after the feast, kill him. All right? Now, they're really dismayed. The next point I'm making is in Luke chapter 19, as, they were right, as Jesus was riding along down this pathway from Bethany to Jerusalem, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice and the mighty works that he did, and saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to shut up. <laughs> Jesus said, if they did, the rocks would cry out. Don't you love that? Jesus is in control. The, the Pharisees are, are hot under the collar. Can you just see them? <laughs> right? Then in John 12, as it ended, it said the whole crowd had gone out after him. The whole crowd has gone in. So here they are. They're plotting against the Lord and his anointed, as it says in Psalm 2. And the one who sits in the heavens laughs. Psalm 76, you need an encouragement today, and you see people seemingly wanting to upset God's purpose in life. Psalm 76 and verse 10, write that down. You need that verse. He says that the, the wrath of, it causes the wrath of man to praise him, the rest he restrains. Did you hear that? He causes the wrath of man to praise him, the rest he restrains. So in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, it says that, that Peter stands before these Jewish people, and these, all the Jews that were there gathered at the, feast, uh, at the Feast of Pentecost, and he's preaching to them and says that Jesus was delivered by the foreknowledge and the and a foreknowledge of God and the purpose and foreknowledge of God. He was delivered. But he says, you, by wicked hands, have crucified the Lord of glory. It was God's purpose, but God used the wrath of man to praise him. The wrath of the men of the Pharisees wanted to put Jesus to death. But God has everything under control. And they'll do it at the right time and in the right way. To give glory to the prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. We can apply that to you. Things on your, in your life going on, on, whatever it is, my sickness, whatever that's going on in your life, you might think the wrath of man has taken advantage of you. You might get discouraged what's going on in the world. The wrath of man is controlled by God. He restrains it. And he says he'll cause it to, pra- to praise him. Understand that. He's in control. So speaking of control, the next point, I just want to look at this perspective from Jesus. Jesus is in control. He was in control when he first came into this world. Okay, at the right time he started his ministry. And when he first started his ministry, he came to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. 
But what did he do? He walked into the temple, and they're selling things in the temple. Now, you understand how that happened. It's in the temple courtyard, but, you know, when a pre- person comes from a distance, they need a lamb. Hey, we got you a lamb over here. Just come right over here and buy it. Now, it's, it's marked up 20%, uh, you know, but they're going to sell you a lamb. And when you give your money, you're supposed to give in temple currency. And I know you don't carry temple currency, but we can help you here. Well, we'll exchange your money for temple currency. Now, you'll be charged a big interest in doing that, but we can satisfy your need to worship God in the proper way. So Jesus walks in and turns the tables over. I, I liked how one preacher said, you know, this was, these were not card tables. These were tables that were stone tables. And he turns them over one after another and shoes the, the birds and shoes the, the sheep and the oxen out of here. He says, this, this is the temple of my father. This is the house of God. How dare you take the house of God and turn it into a place of, of, of merchandise. And in, the disciples scratched their head and they said, you know, they finally remembered, you know, when they were thinking about this later, you know, it does say in the scriptures, the zeal of, of your house has consumed me. You think it was consumed in Jesus? Okay, so he's in control. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is, is preaching in Nazareth, and he reads from Psalm, uh, Isaiah 61, and he sh- shuts the book down. Before he sits down, he says, this day. By the way, Psalm, Isaiah 64 is all about the coming Messiah. Okay? When he shuts it down, he says, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And they're all scratching their heads and saying, wait a minute. This is Joseph's son. They don't get who he is. And he looks at him and says, you'll say to me, physician, heal yourself. And he says, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. And then he said, oh, by the way, in the days of Elijah, when the, the heavens were shut up for, for uh three and a half years. He said Elijah was sent to a widow. Not in Israel, where there were plenty of widows, but he was sent to Zarephath in Sidon, a foreign country. When when the days of Elisha the prophet, there were many lepers in Israel, but he was sent to Naaman, a Syrian, At that point, the people got really upset. And they drove him out of the the synagogue. They drove him to the edge of the land, of the the city where it was, the city was built on a cliff. And they're going to push him off the cliff. But Jesus walked right, right through them. I love that scene. He'll die at a specific time, in a specific way, for a specific purpose. When he fed the 5,000 in John chapter 6, and they were realized, they said, hey, this is a prophet. Uh, would you be, a, I mean, there were probably nearly 2,000 people there, or, or 5,000, excuse me, there were probably 10,000 to maybe 25,000 people with women and children. Okay, and he feeds them all with loaves and fishes, right? And there were some left over. And they said, this is the prophet. And Jesus realized that they're going to make him a king, and so he walked up the mountain. They couldn't stay with him. In Bethany, we understand that he's there, and Mary anoints his feet with his precious ointment and wipes them with her hair. The glory of a woman is her hair. And she wipes his feet with her hair. When they asked about it, Jesus said, she she has done this for my burial. He gave them insight. This was going to happen. Gave them insight he's going to die. But now he's presented as king. And in in chapter 12, verses 12 through 16, we read the account. As they sang Hosanna, they they waved palm branches. Now let me get to the palm branches. The palm branches were part of the Feast of Tabernacles, not the Feast of Passover. But during the intertestamental time, the time between Malachi and, Ma- and Matthew. The Syrians had come in and run over Jerusalem, and was it Maccabees or somebody like that came out and fought and led the charge against them. And he drove them out. 
And the people just cut down their their date palms all over the place. And so they cut down these branches and wave them as victory, victory. So when Jesus is coming to town, some of them didn't understand what was going on, but they were waving these branches and they were thinking, this is Messiah. He's going to go in there and go to the Roman fort and we're going to have life and it's going to be a good life. Hosanna to the king. That's what they're expecting. So whether they really believed in Jesus or not, we don't know, but they're caught up with it. You would have been too. Okay. Um, What's interesting in Luke chapter 19, in the account, when this is going on, Jesus pauses as he enters into the, probably the outskirts of the town, and he begins to weep. Because he knows that people are filled with unbelief. And he knows that in AD 70, Titus the Roman general will come in and wipe out this place. And there'll be great suffering. That's our king. Our king, instead of going to the Roman fort, goes into the temple and once again cleans house. But while he's there, he finds people that were blind and lame. And he heals them. The chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. And children were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were really, really mad. But notice what happened. After he, this happened in the temple, he left, he left Jerusalem. Walked, he walked right back up the hill to Bethany. Well, let's look at the disciples. They were participants. Uh, we, don't, we don't get it in John, but in Matthew, they were told to go into a village of Bethphage, which is right next door, and you'll find a, a, a donkey tied and her colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me, Jesus said. And if anyone asks you uh, about this, you just say, well, the Lord needs them. <laughs> and they'll send you away at once. And that's what happened. I love, oh, don't you love that? We're unti- they're untying the colt. looks like they're stealing something. Hey, what are you doing? The Lord needs it. Okay. No problem. You think he had worked in their hearts? Yeah, he works all things together. He's, he's always guiding. Do you understand the application there? You're real nervous about a job interview. Okay. You're, you're real nervous about... The decisions made in Washington. Okay, when he says in Proverbs 21, 1, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He can turn it wherever he please. Do you believe that? He can turn it. The person you're dealing with, he can turn their heart as easy as he can water. Not a problem. So the disciples, they were students also that they they remember these things after Jesus' resurrection. The crowd, there there are believers that truly believed. They were with uh, Mary and Martha at Lazarus' tomb. They saw Jesus raising him from the dead. And they, you know, they're part of the crowd that went out to meet him. I believe they really did believe. I don't know how strong they believed. There were also thrill seekers. They just learned that Jesus was there and an account of Lazarus, they came out. They just wanted to see him, see Lazarus. And the next day the crowd had come to the feast. They took branches and palm branches, crying out, Hosanna. There's momentum in the crowd as well. Now, what is this all about? Number one, this is preview time. <laughs> you ever notice that I haven't been to a movie theater in years, but they still do previews at movie theaters? Okay. Coming soon, okay? And they'll have a, a, a little, show a little clip. Okay, so this was God's way of doing a, this is preview. Okay, Jesus riding into Jerusalem, and the crowd, some of the, whoever the crowd is, some didn't believe, some did believe. They were caught up in the moments. Wave these palm branches, take off your coat, throw it in the way. This is great, because here comes the king. Preview. Because in 
Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Because Jesus humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, God has highly exalted him. Given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue confess, what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is just a preview. Because one day, whether you have bowed the knee or not, you will that day. But it's best to have bowed the knee now to Jesus because that day is a time you exalt him as your king in his presence. Won't it be grand? We wait for a savior from heaven. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Well, the Pharisees were more frustrated than ever. As I conclude this, the Pharisees are frustrated more than ever, to, and they are right on track because they're going to get mad, get mad, get mad, and they will fulfill God's timetable, and they will take Jesus in at the right time to present him to, before Pilate and demand that Pilate move now to put Jesus on the cross. I know why he's dying on the cross. The sacrificial lambs are being slain at the temple. Jesus is our Passover. Secondly, the crowd, they fulfilled God's purpose in praising the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether they were in on it at their heart or not, they were praising Jesus Christ. It was a way to acknowledge the fact that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. But it also was a way to stir up those Pharisees even more because look to the crowd. They won't stop praising him. <laughs> the disciples were getting the picture more and more. They still didn't get it. They just knew something good was happening. And Jesus is in complete control. He allows the accolades of people probably that had no use for him. They were just looking for what they could get out of this. And it was just used to show their really unbelief. Because Jesus is not the king that comes in and fights a physical fight. He doesn't need to. Jesus is one who is meek and lowly. And he defeats his enemies, not by force, but by death. Listen to the words of Hebrews 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. That's our king. That's our king. He suffered at the right time as the Passover lamb, paid the debt for our sin. Three days later, he rose from the dead. That's our king. If you've not bowed the knee to Jesus, today's the right day to do that. It's the right time. If you have bowed the knee to Jesus, appreciate how he worked all of this together. All the scene of the Pharisees, the crowd, the disciples, and all the people. He, God is working together for the good. And he's working together things in your life too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this account in John 12 of the scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. A conquering king. He may not have conquered the way that people thought he should. But he's there, proclaiming truth, displaying truth, and eventually be taken in and slaughtered as our Passover lamb. Oh, Father, how great is your grace as seen through Jesus Christ our Lord. How we pray that the truth of this scene will permeate our hearts and give us hope and help as we face all kinds of things in life. 
Oh, Father, I pray that you would strengthen each person here, that we might adore you and adore the work of Jesus Christ in this simple account that's really filled with great grace. And so we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd ask our